we are looking at the concept of modality, that is possibility and necessity. And this is part one of an introduction to these ideas. We're laying the foundation for possible world semantics and how analytic metaphysicians talk about necessity and possibility. And so in order to get started here, we can talk about some basic modal notions. And the idea here is we want to try to be neutral in terms of this isn't going to be committed to one theory or another. And so we have what is necessary, meaning that it must be true, right? It cannot possibly be false. That's what we mean when we say at least that a proposition is necessary. The contention, on the other hand, of course, is true, but it could be false. Now, we also have these modal notions of possibility. So something that is possible but not actual is false, but it could be true. And then, of course, there are things that are impossible in any sense. And these are things that cannot possibly be true. Okay, so let's consider some examples. Here are some necessary truths. So these are things that have to be true, can't possibly be false. The claim that five plus seven equals 12 is such a necessary truth. The full statement, if Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal. That is a necessary truth. Or Alvin Plantinga's favorite, no prime minister is a prime number. Right? Justin Trudeau cannot be the number seven. Okay, contingent truths then, are, which we're more familiar with. These are true, but could have been false. So there are more than two colors that you can see on this screen, or you are viewing this while sitting. These things are true, but could be false. And of course, it's possible that you're viewing this while standing. Well, that is also something that then would be true and could be false. Okay, that's fairly simple, straightforward ideas. But there was a concern that has been raised uh, against these concepts of being having metaphysical substance to them. And some have doubted this distinction between the contingent and necessary truths. And some philosophers have claimed that modal notions entirely can't be substantiated by empirical methods and then are inferior because of that or somehow not workable, not something that makes sense. And empiricists especially tend to be skeptical about modality as a whole. And of course, the problem here is that experience could never prove that a truth is necessary. Experience can only tell you what is the case, but not what has to be the case. This idea at least goes back to Hume, for example, uh, someone who would say this as an empiricist. Now, one reason for skepticism in the 20th century is the lack of extensionality with modal claims. And extensionality then is something that's crucial. It's important for logical systems in order to function correctly. And so you have to have extensionality in order to construct a modal logic. Okay, so let's consider this, explain this idea of extensionality. Uh, so think about this sentence, if P then Q. Now, if P is true and Q is false, then the sentence, if P then Q, is false. And we can construct truth tables, we can work with this idea, and you can substitute any true sentence for P, any false sentence for Q, and you can be confident that if P then Q, that statement is false. And that's what we mean by extensionality, right? You can substitute in whatever you need to, and the logical system's going to function well. Okay, the problem was that when using modal language, there seemed to be 
no consistent logical rules of substitution. So extensionality was lacking when we start to talk about modality. So this is kind of the history in the 20th century of what was going on, and you had a lot of empiricists, uh, including Quine, for example, being very skeptical about modality as a metaphysical notion. Of course, Quine was skeptical about other metaphysical notions as well. Okay, so let's consider some examples here of why this seems to be problematic. So it is necessarily true that the tallest man in Indiana is taller than any other man in Indiana. All right, that's a necessary truth. This is the kind of things, thing that modal metaphysicians, right, metaphysicians who take modality seriously would want to say. All right, so that seems reasonable. But if it's true that Roy Hibbert is the tallest man in Indiana, uh, he played for the Pacers up until 2015, so I doubt if he even lives in Indiana anymore. But in any case, if it is true that Roy Hibbert is the tallest man in Indiana, then by substitution, this next sentence should say the same thing as one. Right, by substitution, you should be able to say that it is necessarily true that Roy Hibbert is taller than any other man in Indiana. The problem is, one, seems to be uncontroversial and true, while two is false, right? It's possible that Sean Bradley, who's seven foot seven, would move to Indiana, and then Roy Hibbert would no longer be taller than any other man in Indiana. Okay, so that's a, a problem. You can't do that substitution like you can with normal propositional logic. So let's be very clear here. The problem with necessity that is raised, right? The problem raised against the legitimacy of modal notions had to do with logical principles, right? So it wasn't clear which modal claims followed from any other given modal claim, right? The logic was unclear, and there were no clearly useful principles in order to distinguish, distinguish when phrases could serve as substitutions in sentences and when they could not, right? So we just saw above where you couldn't use Robert Roy Hibbert as a substitute for the tallest man in Indiana. It didn't work, and so it wasn't clear when it would work, and when it wouldn't. And without those logical principles in place, modal talk, modal language was considered to be on shaky ground. So those metaphysicians who take modality seriously were then put on the defensive. Now this uh, set up the projects to clarify metaphysical necessity that began in the mid to late 20th century. So, metaphysical necessity, what does that involve? Now, without getting into particular theories, let's set this up, and in part two, we'll start uh, talking a little bit more about how theories might go. But metaphysical necessity as a whole, these include logical and mathematical truth. So, these include the previously mentioned argument about Socrates, right? If Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, then Socrates is mortal. Right, that statement would be a logical truth, the truth of modus ponens, right? The truth of any argument that follows the P, if P then Q, therefore Q, right? That is a metaphysical necessity. And of course, any mathematical truth, uh, four times three equals 12 will suffice as an example, right? This also includes analytic truths, truths that are true by definition. So red is a color and no song lyrics have a mass, right? Those are metaphysical necessities as well. And just to clarify then, it is not causal necessity that we're talking about. So uh, Pettit never jumped over the backboard is causally necessary, but it's not metaphysically necessary. Okay, so we're not talking about causal necessity when we're talking about metaphysical necessity. Okay, one more point. This is not an epistemic category. 
Okay, it's there's a difference here between metaphysics and epistemolo epistemology, and this significance difference applies here. We're not talking about an epistemic category when we're doing metaphysical necessity. So there's this huge difference between what can be known and what is actually the case. So it's possible one might think, well, for all I know, 287 times 987 equals 2,000. 282,769, yeah, that seems about right. I mean, if you're doing this uh, with guessing, 987, that's pretty close to 1,000. That'd be 287,000, but it's not quite going to, to be that. Let's see, seven times seven is nine. This ends in nine. Yeah, for all I know, uh, that's true, right? Uh, by the way, it's actually 280. 3,269. That's what 287 times 987 is. Okay. So how one knows something is an epistemic distinction while being a necessary or a contingent truth, that's a metaphysical distinction. That's what we are interested in. All right. Just to clarify uh, a little bit more, we're not talking about unrevisability when we say something's metaphysically necessary. That would be an epistemic category. Okay, so for example, I was born in Iowa, right? That's unrevisable. Now that that's been done, that's the case, uh, it can't be changed. But that doesn't mean that's a metaphysical necessity. It's also not equivalent to something being known a priori, right? So uh, just quickly, having a belief a priori is something that might be figured out prior to any particular experiences of the world. So, for example, the Pythagorean theorem, you can figure that out with having, without having any particular experiences, right? And certainly, uh, just to illustrate this, there are a priori contingent truths, things that we know a priori but they're not metaphysically necessary. So my belief that I exist, I know that a priori. I don't have to have any particular experiences, but it's a contingent truth. It's possible that I didn't exist. And just to give a flip side uh, example here, there are a posteriori necessary truths. That is, at least if you follow Kripke, uh, which I, I do for these purposes, Right, so if, for example, uh, Hesperus equals phosphorus, these Hesperus is identical with phosphorus, something apparently discovered uh, at some time in the past. The evening star is the same as the morning star. They are both actually the planet Venus, uh, different names for the planet Venus. And so that's actually a necessary truth. They, they, Venus is Venus, it has to be the same thing. Or uh, if you're pointing at a, a table and say it's made of molecules. Well, that table that you're pointing at, that particular table has to be made of molecules. That's a necessary truth. So those are examples of what we're, we're talking about when we're talking about necessary truths. And we'll go on to explore this concept in much more detail in the introduction part two. And then after that, we'll be talking about various ways that individuals have approached metaphysical modality.